Aiden, it's been two weeks since our last pod, and with the volatile swings of this AFL season, it feels like so much has changed. When we last spoke, Sydney were on a 10-game win streak. Um, we know how that looks, how that's looking now. And when we last spoke, North were at the bottom of the ladder. So we have much to discuss. Let's jump into the top five players of the round. With my fifth best player of the round, it's a fun one. I got Callan Ward as my fifth best player of the round. He was epic. Two goals, 30 disposals, 80%. And it was the composure <coughs> in the big moments that really stood out. He kicked a massive goal in the final quarter when it looks like Carlton <coughs> could have gone on a run. And I think he's just really settled into his position after being out of the side at the start of the year. Definitely. He's found some serious form along with GWS, who maybe stamped their claim today that they're making a charge. Uh, my top five this week, i just say it now, is r- it's star-studded. It's star-studded. It's all guys that will be Brownlow shouts at some point in their career. At, <coughs> at number five, I've got Patrick Cripps. Uh, in a losing performance, he continued his pretty remarkable run of form that he's been on where he has just been, uh, you know, I, I think he should be captain of the All-Australian team as it sits right now, either him or Bontempelli, because the way that he leads this team, he just gets 20-plus contested possessions every week. He got another 11 clearances here. Uh, was willing Carlton to a result with two goals and 33. Uh, he really is doing it all and plays with such an intensity that I think defines uh, this Carlton team this year, and I thought he was amazing. I like it. My number four was Jesse Hogan. So he kicked five goals, plus gave some off. Carlton had absolutely no answer for him. I'm not sure why Weedering didn't go to him. Maybe it was the slight injury, but Kemp was absolutely smashed. I think he's got the most contested marks inside 50 in the season, and we saw exactly why. Every time, single time the ball goes into the forward 50, did exactly what you want a key forward doing. He brought the ball to ground, or he took, he took a contested mark. Yeah. So yeah, deserved to top five of the round. He's got really sticky hands. Uh, 100%. Has his whole career, but when he's on, he's he's almost impossible in the contest. At four, I've got Zach Butters. When I watched this, I'm going to talk more about it later, but this first quarter, uh, Rosie and Butters between them, and you know what? I'm just going to take your spot and talk about my number three. I'll talk about them in combination. Four Butters, three Rosie. They just completely tore apart that Bulldogs midfield. Uh, they had just ridiculous stats at quarter time. Rosie, I think, had 18, uh, and Butters had... 14 and a goal and Wines had another 12 or something and they were just manhandling a pretty star-studded Bulldogs midfield and the two of them were both awesome I like it I like it my number three was Harry Sheasel so yeah 35 disposals a goal 14 contested possessions 10 clearances he's really growing as a leader we look at their team now LDU Wardlaw Simkin McKercher Combin they're really starting to build and Larky build these key position players and he started to move forward, further forward in the ground. He's really having an impact, especially on the scoreboard, and I think deserved my, my top three. Number two this week was, was Lockie Neal. Uh, the game just finished. We saw what can happen when he's untagged. 36 disposals, three goals, 77% with 10 clearances. He puts up stat lines, especially... It's crazy with Lockie Neal, because as you say, I really am starting to jump on board with your opinion that he's the best player untagged in the comp. Um, that... He has these stat lines at half time, which no one else has. What was it again? Constantly. He had three goals in 24 at half time. Three goals in 24. And then, because you get lazy coaching, or as you said to me today, arrogant coaching, where they don't put a tagger on him. And then at half time, they say, okay, we got to chuck someone to him. And then he ends up with a less ridiculous second half. But he just, when he's not tagged, he has first half stat lines that no one else has. It's, it's pretty ridiculous. At my number two. I had Zach Merritt. Okay. He was phenomenal. Um, he has been all year, but this week against Collingwood, Essendon got such a crucial win. Uh, we know how even it is from about 2nd to 14th or yeah, 13th, 13th. And 13th in yeah. the ladder. Yeah, and then there's a the big drop-off. And a game like this against Collingwood, who were right beside them on the table, was absolutely crucial. And Merritt stood up and led their midfield. Caldwell and Durham were awesome as well. And that's been a story of the year, that young Essendon midfield. But Merritt was awesome. 15 score involvements, Aiden. Another contender for the All-Australian captain. Yeah, 15 cont- uh, score involvements. Jeez, I'm going to put my hands up. I completely forgot about <laughs> him. I didn't remember the Friday night game. My number one, I had the triple threat. I think I've done it before. I had Rosie Butters and Jason Horn-Francis <laughs> my number one. 89 disposals, five goals, 24 score involvements, 
averaging 77% disposal efficiency between them and 19 clearances. Completely tore the game apart in the first quarter <laughs> and finished it with three quarters to go. Takes all credibility away from these segments. We've already talked about him, but my number one was Lockie Neal. Nothing else needs to be said. Best player in the comp when untagged. Brisbane are charging, and speaking of, let's talk about who we think is going to make the eight from here. I'll start off with my locks, and I've got five of them, which is probably dodgy because, as we say, there's this really tight contest from second to 13th. My five locks are Sydney, Carlton, Brisbane, GWS, and Fremantle. Now, Sydney and Carlton, it goes without saying, both had losses this week, but let's not have too much recency bias, uh, that they're going to make the eight. Brisbane. They're one of two teams, I'd say right now, that have no questions to answer. I think Brisbane and Carlton have no questions to answer. With the Swans, I think that while I think the media would be ill-advised to jump to conclusions about how they're peaking too early, uh, slow first quarters and all the rest, I do think they have to answer questions about those first quarters and about making sure that they hit this explosive form at the right time. My other two locks, GWS made a statement this week against Carlton. I've said throughout the year that performances aside, and they sit precariously on the edge of the eight, their personnel is just so strong that when they get that fitness back, especially through the midfield, they've got Canelio out, now Josh Kelly out, they're going to be a force to be reckoned with. And Fremantle, I've seen enough now. Uh, we, we've said throughout the whole year, their backline, finals ready. Their midfield, finals ready. It's about whether they can score enough goals and I think they found just enough firepower in the forward line between Josh Tracy, Jaya Miss, and then I think the real little final bit there has been putting Hayden Young there to spend more time in the forward line. He's kicked, I think, seven or eight goals in the last three weeks. Doing it without Alex Pierce at the moment as well. Absolutely. And then my other three are Geelong, who have had a couple good games in a row since we last spoke. Essendon, who I think this performance against Collingwood... The main reason I've got them in here is because of their position on the ladder. They have a couple games to lose above the rest of the pack. And Collingwood, this was a really difficult one for me. Um, the way they're playing at the moment, I don't, I wouldn't put them there. But I've, I've put them there because of based on respect for the footy they've put together over two and a half years. And that I just get a sense that they'll put it together at some point and get a few wins together. I like it. Mine's very similar. I'm going <laughs> to run through my, my locks. So I have Sydney... Carlton, Fremantle, Brisbane, and I have Essendon as yeah. a lock. This was a massive game for them. <coughs> I think last week it was a thing about if they were going to make the eight. Now I think they're just too far in front. Not saying they're going to finish in, in the top four, but with the fixtures they have, they have coming up and two games clear of the top eight, I just think they're a lock. I have Geelong, GWS, and eighth spot was a really hard spot because it was about five or six teams this could have been. So we're the same so far, and I was the sa- I had the same comfortable seven. Yes. Who did you put there? I had the Bulldogs. So we've got one difference. At, at number eight. I just I think Collingwood, with my check now going out, I don't know how long the injury... I think, actually, no, I saw he's out for the rest of the season with a pectoral injury. I think they're a bit light at the back. They're very light in the forward line, and I don't know how much Nick Dacos can carry. So I'm going to put Carling- Collingwood... Premiership winners not finishing inside the eight. I want to read you off just quickly Bulldogs' next four games. Next four games, Carlton at Marvel, mm-hmm. GW, uh, sorry, Geelong at GMHBA, Sydney at the SCG, and then Melbourne at Marvel. It's I'm, a difficult I'm not run. saying it's going to be easy. There are, if you look at the, the other... <laughs> the con- next three If is you look at ridiculous. the other contenders for the, for the top eight, a lot of them uh, have, tough playing, runs. Uh, have tough runs and are yeah. playing each other. Yeah. I just think they're going to pull through. <coughs> And yeah. they get it. They've got some players back now, and this eighth spot could have gone to anyone. Last week, I had it going to Gold Coast or Hawthorne. This week, I'm going to give it to the Dogs. Next week, I'm not sure. Yeah, and let notable teams that neither of us mentioned there: Melbourne and Port. Neither of us put in our top eights. So these are teams that were top four contenders over the last four or five years, and we're potentially seeing the end of that window for them. And the Flyhawk run, I think, is is done. Yep, unfortunately. Let's move on to the next segment in hits and misses. North Melbourne are going to be a force in the coming years. One more key forward to play with Larky, another key back to play with Combin. They have the midfield. McKercher will eventually do the sort of sheasel role. He's going to move further forward. LDU in a better north side, I think could be a top five player in the league, just with the people around him. Uh, Sheasel's a star. Wardlaw's probably going to be the rising star. We know Larky's quality, and it's about damn time. 
yeah that that they've turned up poor curtis I, he needs a mention in there 100 percent. they've got they've got stars who are just sort of popping up all over the ground oh archer as well mm, he, jackson he, archer jackson archer's been huge at the back i just think it's really it's really good to see north finally have a team that maybe starts to compete in the it's next couple of years good to just see on a game-to-game basis them competing and just in coming into a north game not knowing what the result's going to be um yeah I've, I've absolutely loved it my hit was just, I want to talk more about that Port Adelaide midfield domination against the Bulldogs. What was so special about it is the fact that it was the Bulldogs midfield. The Bulldogs, who have been talked about as one of the real final contenders, for some people, one of the real final locks before this week. Uh, and the reason for that is their midfield. Bontempelli, now now fully healthy. Bontempelli, Libba, Richards, Trelaw, Sanders, McRae, all playing and in full health this, health this game. And I... I they just got absolutely trampled. So Butters, Rosie, Horn Francis, Wines were just, they were just everywhere and they were doing doing everything, finding space, being explosive, finding so much of the ball. And that is what we saw with Port Adelaide when they got 13 wins in a row last year. Neither of us had them in the eight in that previous segment. If they're going to make it, they're going to need more performances like that. 100%. I just didn't back in the consistency, which is the reason why I didn't have them in my eight. Oh, yeah. My miss is I'm missing Thursday night footy. Yeah. Get rid of the two games early afternoon on a Saturday at 1.45 p.m. our time and bring it back. I know that there's, it must be a TV deal, but there's no problem with crowds. I know that <coughs> people love the Thursday night games. Everyone loves the Thursday night games. AFL, sort it out. I'm so upset about it. Every Thursday... I, I I get I get to work and I'm thinking God there's no footy tonight like it's I'm actually thinking about it. I know it's, so it's really disappointing. I just had a, had a thought that just the extra day of footy yeah. is so significant. I just thought it was a big miss to the AFL. Oh, now I'm sad. Okay, <laughs> my miss. I actually had a different miss, but just talking about North just reminded me how horrific Gold Coast are away from home. So I'm gonna make that my miss. I feel like they're the miss every week, every second week when they when they play away. It's like in the first sort of 10 games of the year, it was every week we were alternating between the Essendon edge as a hit and a miss. But Gold Coast, like two weeks ago, last podcast in the power rankings, we mentioned Gold Coast and we said, it is just ridiculous the difference between their performances home and away. And then I said, Aiden, what's the next couple of fixtures? You said next, home against Collingwood. I said, I expect them to win. And then you said, and then away against North. And we, I said, I expect him to lose. Speaking of that, never in my <laughs> life did I think I'd put money on North Melbourne to win in this season. I did against Gold Coast. Yeah. So yeah, both of us have the doubts. Yeah. Especially yeah, Collingwood to win. And beat, then they did that. And then they beat Collingwood. Exactly. With a, just a really well put together performance. Four quarter performance. Strong display all over the ground. That, that set of key backs in Collins, Ballard and MacAndrew was dominant. The midfield was awesome. And then the next week... They just look... They're the worst side in the comp when they're in away from home. In two weeks, they have West Coast and Optus Stadium. Yeah. I think they have Richmond as their other away game. So surely they win one. Surely they will get one away game. It actually makes no sense to me. Uh, but yeah, that's, that's my miss for the round. Let's jump into the footy pyramid. There have been a lot of changes in the pyramid. We didn't have one last week. I still made it. And now two weeks into the pyramid, players have moved around everywhere. We have three outs. Blakey actually came into the pyramid last week. He's now out. <laughs> Will Day is out of the pyramid. And Liberatore is out of the pyramid. In the fifth tier, Tom Green enters the pyramid again. Sam Walsh holds his spot. He actually went up and then down in the last two weeks. Mm. Butters is new in the pyramid. Kerno moves down a ranking. And Sicily holds his spot just because I've seen how important he is to Hawthorne now. Sarong holds his spot in the fourth tier. Chad Warner moves down a tier. Yep. Harry Sheasel enters the pyramid in the, in the fourth tier. The she's. Now what I've done is I've done some research as well. <laughs> I have his stats since round 10. <laughs> round 10, 32 disposals, 32 disposals at 80%, 8 score involvements. Round 11. That's my guy. 1 goal, 25 disposals, 6 score involvements. Mm. Round 12, bye. Round 13, 1 goal, 30 disposals, mm. Eight score involvements. Round 14, two goals, 18 disposals. Round 15, two goals, 27 disposals. Mm. Round 16, one goal, 27 disposals, eight score involvements. The she's. And round 17, one goal, 35 disposals. In the last five weeks, he's averaging 1.4 goals a game at 27 disposals yep. a game. He's an absolute star of the competition, and the performances didn't really stand out too much in a struggling north side, but they are now. And Zach Merritt is in the fourth tier as well. 
In the third tier, Goulden moves down. Lockie Neal moves up a yep. tier. And Isaac Heaney is off the top. He's moved down two tiers. Wow. It's two consecutive weeks of moving down wow. one tier. It's not just off the back of this performance, which wasn't actually terrible. Yeah, two goals in 20-something. But there are other players that have, that have just leapfrogged him. In the second tier, Nick Dacos has, has joined him. Oh, I need to know which one of the two is at the top. Cripps is in the second tier. And Marcus Bontempelli is holding his place in the first tier, but it's incredibly close between Cripps and Bont at the moment. That was the toughest toughest call for me. Yeah, and I'll tell you all quickly, I do a Brownlow medal predictor where for each game I allocate 3-2-1 votes. I did it once two years ago and it correctly predicted Cripps as the winner, so I have this false sense of confidence with it. And I currently have Cripps three votes clear, three votes clear. of Dacos and Heaney tied in second uh, with Bont a vote behind. So uh, Patrick Cripps, look out for Brownlow number two this year and let's head into the power rankings. Now, similar to your footy pyramid, because it's been a couple of weeks, there are some absolutely drastic changes to this, to these power rankings, and I'll try to talk through them. In 18th, we have Richmond. Still North not at the bottom, and they're not in 17th either. It's West Coast in 17th. I like it. The North are climbing. And who, hey, we know West Coast, they're going to have patches, and they're in one of those down patches, but we want to see them back again by the end of the year. 16th, North Melbourne, and we want to see them keep charging up. We've already talked them up and and we just love to see the She's leading them to glory. Next up, Adelaide. Just continue to be disappointing for their fans. And most teams have sort of had some sort of renaissance, like St Kilda have had a big week this week. Adelaide fans aren't getting that this year, I don't think. Next up, before we get to St Kilda, a team a few wins ahead of them, Gold Coast. I'm not putting them... I feel really comfortable having Gold Coast this low despite them being eight wins, eight losses. And the reason is, if you cannot win away from home against, as much as we love North, the worst team in the competition, then what are you as a team? Damien Hardwick had a really... Oh, do you want to talk about his press conference? He was he was talking about... What did, they, what did he say they need to do? Well, he said they need to grow the up. As an organisation, yeah. Um, I think that... Sums it up pretty well. Damien Hardwick, he was absolutely steaming and, and fair enough. Next up, we have St Kilda, who, hey, just took a huge scalp. Um, we haven't talked much about the Sydney game, so we'll take the opportunity now. St Kilda played awesome. Their pressure was phenomenal they throughout. They really ramped it up in that fourth quarter. Yeah, they, they brought it early, and then Sydney obviously brought it back and got a big lead, 25-ish. But St Kilda just ramped up the pressure. Sydney, Sydney sort of choked under the pressure. And fair enough to St Kilda that Ross Lyons seems to be inspiring them. They're not going to make finals, but inspiring them to play some good footy. Next up, we have Melbourne, who got a big win this week. And look, there's absolutely no reason that they couldn't that they couldn't make the eight. It's wide open for any of those teams up until 13th. It's wide open for any of them if any of them want to get on a hot streak. Uh, so but I think Melbourne sit at the bottom of that pack at the moment, uh, of that top 12, I guess. Next up is Port and... It's difficult because we were talking so negatively about them. They scrape a win against St Kilda last week um, due to some inaccuracy, really, from St Kilda's side. And then this week, they just tear apart the dogs. So uh, we, we'll need to see some consistency there, but it's just so tight with these teams that you'd, uh, they could jump so quickly, so uh, quite high in this pyramid, uh, in, in these power rankings. But this is where I've got them right now. Next up is the Bulldogs. Now they, it's weird because I still I think that they might uh, they, they probably fall out of the premiership profile or the pre, uh, premiership window for the first time this season where they they're not top six for attack and defense, but it's so disappointing for Bulldogs fans that they seem to have a strong attack, strong uh, defense and a dominant midfield and they're eight and eight. Uh, they they just can't string together consistent form. And we saw it again this week, just dominated when it looked like they were really becoming a uh, a consistent finals contender. Next up is Collingwood. Now they've dropped quite a bit. They've dropped five spots since the last power rankings, and it's worrying. They have lost a couple in a row now, and we're just not seeing that Collingwood... um, You've seen articles about how they've lost their aura. Uh, articles on AFL.com that we know Collingwood had that aura where you could be up 40 against them with 15 minutes left and you're terrified and they and they ended up getting the job done half the time in those situations. That doesn't seem to be the case anymore. Uh, they're going to need some inspiration and some motivation or, or because 
they're just not looking like that side that they were that won the Premiership last year. I still believe in them to, uh, to make the finals, however. I think they've got enough there. In eighth, I've got Essendon. Now, while you have them as a lock for the eight... I did. I'm not fully sold. I think they win some big games. I just think because they're two games clear. Yeah, it's where they sit on the ladder. But I think in terms of if I trust them to win a game tomorrow, I, 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 it's weird. I feel like they, they sort of show up for big games and you've got to respect them for that. They've, they've shown up this season, but they don't play... Like their, their percentage is still below 100, Aiden. Yeah, I know. How weird is it? They sit in the top four, third? I don't know. And they, and they third or fourth, and they don't... I'll have a look. I'm, I'm checking right now. Yeah, they, they sit in fourth place, and their percentage is below 100. And I just don't really know what to think. I'm, I'm very confused when it comes to Essendon. Next up is Geelong. They're firing now. With Dangerfield back in the midfield, they seem to have a strong enough midfield to support their elite forward line. And they, yeah, they're... They're so dynamic, the way that they move it through the ground. Their move is in the half-forward area. Jeremy Cameron, Brian Myers, Patrick Dangerfield, Ollie Dempsey now. Doesn't get better than that in the competition. Uh, and so they, they score so many goals when they have everyone fit and firing. What about the impact of Dangerfield, though? A 30, yeah. 35 years yeah. old, comes into a Geelong side and completely revolutionises the midfield whenever he's playing. The guy has just a level of power that you don't really see. Uh, I've never seen a player quite like him. Um, I'm not to say I'd say Dusty's probably the best player I've ever seen Dangerfield's absolutely up there uh, and the fact that he still has this scary sort of, at 35 that, to have that impact on a team at 35 Geelong had lost what was it 7 from 8 or 6 from 7 so, but getting dominated in the midfield absolutely yeah getting trampled trampled in the midfield just with that young midfield and for Dangerfield to have this much of an impact on, on other players performances too Tom Atkins and, uh, and others have really stood up it's amazing next up we have GWS Said it throughout the year, I, the, my vibes on them have always been higher than their performances. Before the season started, they were my premiership favourites, and I still probably have them at fourth or fifth, uh, if I was to say it right now, because they're just so talented, uh, and I think well coached by Adam Kingsley. Um, and I think when we see two or three good performances from them in a row, they just tore apart Carlton. Next week, not tore apart, but they had a great performance against Carlton. Next week, maybe a confidence booster against Richmond, and then home against Gold Coast, a couple of soft matches. I think they can really build Still momentum. Still missing Taylor and Kelly as well. Yeah, but I do think their fixtures in the next couple, they can maybe really build some momentum, uh, momentum towards finals, maybe sneak into the top four. Next up, Hawthorne. I don't care that they're unlikely to make finals. The way that they've played over the last nine weeks... They deserve to still be here, and I really just want to continue to pay them that respect until they've lost it. So they lost this week, but we've seen every single team this year uh, has had poor performances, uh, sort of out of nowhere, but the, the body of work that they're putting together deserves to keep them up here. Fourth place, Fremantle. Uh, lock for the eight. As we said, we know that they have one of the best backlines in the league, if not the best. One of the best midfields in the league this year. In the stats-wise, they've been the best in the clearance battle and the contested possessions battle, which is pretty remarkable. And now they've, they're finding enough to score goals in the forward line. Third place, Brisbane. They seem to have it all together now. Uh, they do. I think every team will be scared of playing Brisbane uh, come come September. Uh, I know. I reckon if there's one team I don't want to play round one, it's it's probably Brisbane uh, as, as a Swans fan. So... They are. They just look really complete at the moment. Scary thing is they could easily sneak into fourth. <laughs> yeah, but I'm not. Yeah, they could absolutely. Despite the 0 and 4 start. Yeah. Such a strange season. Yeah. They were 0 and 4 and they're in the anyway. <laughs> and second place. I'm keeping Carlton there. Yes, they had a loss this week, but it's against a good and talented GWS side that had everything to play for. And Carlton, they they've been strong and reliable throughout the year, and I'm going to let them stay there. And Sydney, likewise, I'm going to let them stay in one, but they're no longer jumping off the top of the table. They can be beaten. They can be knocked off first place in these power rankings. Have, have teams found them out? I know we talked about the headlines yeah. that have come in, but if we just put it into, into perspective here, <coughs> Logan McDonald has a kick after the siren to win the game. He misses. He drops short. He could have kicked it behind to draw. Mm -hmm. Logan McDonald has a kick with 50 yeah. seconds to go to win the game. Kicks it behind. If he kicks both those goals, the conversation is different. Can I tell you exactly what the narrative is if those two very makeable kicks go through? The, the, the narrative is 
They've done it winning comfortably, and now they've shown they can do it in the close games as well. They've got heart too. They're fi- they're, they're, this team is going to be impossible to stop. So that's just a couple kicks difference. And it shows these narratives are going to come, and deservedly so, you've lost a couple games in a row. You've been cracked by a not-so-strong St. Kilda team now. So the Swans are going to have to believe in themselves and not, not get in their heads. That's what's going to have to happen from here. This first quarter thing, it's worrying. It's been a while, and there's no good reason for it. It's got to be now that they're in their heads and they believe in it now at, at some level, or at least some of them do. Well, I messaged you and I was like, what cracks first? The Swans first quarter yeah. hoodoo or the Gold Coast winning away Yeah. Uh, hoodoo? Or the Gold Coast winning at home hoodoo. <laughs> true, <laughs> so, true. They, they can't lose at home. Anyway, so uh, I think the Swans are going to have to deal with those narratives now. And honestly, I know that this is very easy to say, but I am happy that this has happened now and not five weeks later. Uh, so that the Swans have time to deal with this and deal with the adversity with plenty of time to build momentum before finals and, and rebuild that confidence. So, you know what? I'm happy that they've been tested and they're going to have to figure something out. Well, yeah, I don't mind as long as they start to continue to, to peak again toward, towards finals. I think last week's loss was probably, a, as we settled on, a good thing. This week wasn't so great, especially yep. being up 25, <coughs> 25 points and slowly slipping away once St Kilda started to put put the pressure on. But I think now it, it brings the opportunity to potentially change a few things. Yeah. Personnel, maybe. I don't know how, how far away Mills is. I know Parker is, is suspension, maybe another two weeks. So maybe <coughs> it just opens up the door for, it, for a yeah. couple of players in the VFL who haven't really got to look into the side. Absolutely. And the one thing I want to add is, I don't think it's a knock on the players, but they're not playing with the hunger over the last couple of weeks. They're not playing with the hunger of a team that's cl- scratching and clawing for a top eight spot or scratching and clawing for a top four spot. When you're in this comfortable position, it's it's difficult to fight as hard, to go as hard for the footy and to chase as hard and to run as hard to just become that one extra option. So hopefully this is a lesson for them that you still need to play that way and fight like you're on the brink of the eight. doesn't matter if you're... Still two and a half, three games clear, which we still are despite two losses. So. Well, we're still going to back the Swans to be there on grand final day. We're going to back yep. the Swans to win, to win the grand final. Let us know what you think, <coughs> and we'll see you all on the next one.